other face to face. I am so excited. I have so much I want to share with you. Um, and my husband knows that I love to talk. So he's always saying, babe, make sure you make an outline, make your PowerPoint, stick to your outline, because I will go on and on, especially when I'm talking about something that I'm very passionate about. And there are two things that I am so passionate about. Uh, one, classics. Um, two is racial healing. Um, and those things are just, they keep me up at night. They're all in my journals. They're all I think about. Um, and so I'm hoping that this talk with you today will help you understand my heart and also get you excited about this really weird idea that classics and the canon can be used to bring us together. When I first said that statement, it was probably, I had probably just graduated from St. John's back in 2009 and I was missing St. John's. I was missing um, the experience of just 
people relating to each other in these humane ways, even if we disagreed and talking about beautiful, wonderful literature. And even if we disagreed, we could still go grab some coffee or grab a you know cone of ice cream and still be friends. It was an experience I had not really ever experienced in any type of environment, even an African-American environment or a, a white environment. And so I was missing that. And I was sharing with my husband, I said, you know, I really miss it. And I think, I really think we could end all of this racial trauma if we just all sat down and read a, read a classic together. And my husband looked at me like, okay, really, seriously, that's your solution. <laughs> But it is my solution and I'm not ashamed to say it. And I'm hoping that the case I present to you today will make you a believer. My husband's a believer now though, by the way. Um, and I'm hoping I can make you a believer as well. Um, I'm just gonna put up my title screen so that you can, um, there are times when I speak where people wanna know how to get in touch with me afterwards. Maybe they still have more questions. I've also gotten messages like, I don't agree with something you said, let's talk about it. And I'm always open for those types of discussions. So I just thought I'd share um, how you can contact me, where you can find me in the cyber world. Um, there's my website and my email address and um, I'm always available. Okay, so um, the first thing I wanna say is the case I wanna build, the foundation I wanna start with is a lot of times when we think about racial healing, we think in terms of black people need to forgive or black people need to be healed or white people need to do something to make help black people to forgive. But I'm coming from a very different perspective, which I feel is very much rooted in classics. And I hope you will join me in this magical world where there is no color line and we're all equally human. Will you join me? And then I want us to all see if we can get our minds around the fact that we all need to be set free. Before I go any further, I wanna start off with a spiritual. I always start off with spirituals because the spiritual, the Negro songs are the first sign of black people trying to connect with this new world through a classic text, that being the Bible. And so I'm gonna start off with this song and, um, oh, let me share my verse, uh, theme verse first. It's Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there any male or female, for you are all one. If this was a non-Christian non environment, I'd stop at the word one. But since we all are here and we are going to uh, here at Belmont Abbey, I feel free to say we are all one in Christ. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom over me. And before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. What if I told you that we all need to be set free. There is a little bit of a story I wanna to read to you from the autobiography of Frederick Douglass that really opened my eyes to outside of the box that I had been kind of in where there's sides. And Frederick Douglass helped me to see who loved classics by the way. And I wonder if his study of classics gave him this new perspective, I think it did. Where we all are equally human and we all are hurt and scarred by racism. Not one against the other, but we all are. And I wanna read this text that Frederick Douglass wrote about his master's wife. And it was very eye-opening for me. And he goes, my new mistress proved to be all she appeared when I first met her at the door. A woman of the kindest heart and finest feelings. She had never had a slave under her control previous to myself. And prior to her marriage, she had been dependent upon her own way of living. She was by trade a weaver and by constant application to her business, she had been in a good degree preserved from the blighting and dehumanizing effects of slavery. That line right there, he really gives us a new perspective that even she was a victim of this. 
I was utterly astonished at her goodness. I scarcely knew how to behave towards her. She was entirely unlike any other white woman I had ever seen. I could not approach her as I was accustomed to approach other white ladies. My early instruction was all out of place. The crouching servility, usually so acceptable a quality in a slave, did not answer when manifested toward her, towards her. Her favor was not gained by it. She seemed to be disturbed by it. She did not deem it impudent, impudent or unmannerly for a slave to look her in the face. The meanest slave was put fully at ease in her presence and none left without feeling better for having seen her. Her face was made of heavenly smiles and her voice of tranquil music. But alas, this kind heart had but a short time to remain. The fatal poison of irresponsible power was already in her hands and soon commenced its infernal work. That cheerful eye under the influence of slavery soon became red with rage. That voice made all of sweet accord changed to one of harsh and horrid discord. And that angelic face gave place to that of a demon. That's in chapter six of Frederick Douglass's autobiography. It's the first time I've seen a former slave write with so much empathy for those who enslaved him. And that right there just gave me an understanding that it's not us against you, you against us, it's us all being scarred by the horrible sin of racism. And so my talk today is gonna take you on this journey where I feel like the canon could be a tool to, to free all of us, to liberate all of us. And I'm gonna use examples from people of my uh, heritage to show how they liberated themselves. And hopefully the examples I share with you will inspire you uh, as you think through this. And then I'm gonna go through and talk about how the canon can be used to bring um, healing. I'm gonna look at how uh, formerly enslaved people and oppressed people, black people use the canon to heal their minds and their hearts and their souls. And then we're gonna end with unity, which is where we're trying to get to where we all are together, working hard to root out this sin in our society, in our hearts, and I say our, meaning myself, including all of us. And we become committed to this work of coming together and being open to the thought that these texts that the world has of course deemed as culturally irrelevant, as so relevant to bringing unity to all of us. Let me tell you how I got here. I was not always this person before you that I'm speaking to. Um, my father is a pastor. My mom, stay-at-home mom and head of education uh, at our church. And they had a very strong conviction of my brother and I, that's my daughter and I at my doctor. I'll tell you about that a little bit later. But, um, and my son in the background. But um, they were very committed to our faith so much so that they decided not to put us in public schools. And we were only placed in um, any uh, Christian schools in the, the Washington DC area. So my brother and I went to some of the top Christian schools in the Maryland DC area. And a lot of times we were the only African-American um, students there or one of a small group. And both of us endured, it was the seventies, a lot of racism. And those experiences really affected my view, my relationships with those who don't look like me. When I graduated from high school, I didn't want anything else to do with any type of Christian institution. And I hope you don't mind me being brutally honest about my journey because I think you can appreciate how God has changed my heart, has changed my mind, and I hopefully it'll inspire you as well. And I was, my brother and I both went to Howard University. My, my dad was a professor there. And we were like, please put us on an HBCU. I wanna be with my people. I wanna feel the love of my people because from literally pre-K through 12th grade, we did not get to experience that. Well, I graduated from Howard, went on to grad school. Um, and around that time of working on one of my master's degrees, my parents had the bright idea of starting a classical school. I thought they were crazy. You may have heard this story, but it's leading to something. I thought they were crazy. 
I thought they were not trying to provide a, a, an education that was relevant to the African-American people. And my mind went back to my um, experiences in elementary school and high school and middle school. Um, but they were, they were just committed. Um, I've interviewed them now recently just to see what made them do it. And we have gone on this journey to remember their educational background and realize that my parents had a classically inspired background, which is what drew them to classical education. And they really felt that it would be a tool for the African-American community. So I fought them. And of course, they're more stubborn than I am. So they were like, whatever, we're gonna open it anyway. And they did. I, on the other hand, had this wonderful high paying job in the public school system. And I was going to, you know, educate the young people about, you know, the truth of the African-American heritage and free their minds and all of that good stuff. And I became disillusioned with the public school system. I was like, I don't think this is the place for me. Number one, I don't like not being able to share my faith openly. And something was just missing. I shared this with my parents and my mom said, well, you can come work at the school. And I did. I'm giving you the short version. And I did. And so um, I went on, I said, well, I'm not really interested in classics. I'm just gonna teach music and drama and stay in my little performing arts corner. At this time, I was starting also my PhD. And I said, well, I'm researching the, how art can be, how the arts can be used to help, uh, especially black students engage with literature. And I was gonna be a famous uh, theater ed scholar. And I had a grad assistantship and my path was laid out. And then I was walking down the hall. So I was working my PhD part-time and I was working at my parents' school part-time. Mind you saying, I'm not gonna have anything to do with classics. They're not for me, they're not for our people, but I'm gonna teach these students how to act and sing and so on. I'm walking down the hall and I run across a high school class studying the canon and they were not interested and the teacher could not get them to engage. And I really think it was a trick. God tricked me. I'm convinced he tricked me because without even thinking, I said, oh my goodness, let me help you. I can come up with some drama lessons. I can put my master's degree to work and I'll come up with drama lessons to help them you know, engage with what you're reading. Let me see some of those books that you're reading. I'll read and prepare my lessons, totally tricked. Instantly, the moment I took, it was either Aristotle or something from Plato, it was a, it was a true classic. I remember taking that text home and becoming so engaged, there was an instant addiction to reading classics and the canon. And I don't know, I'm, I feel like some of you may identify with me. You can probably remember that moment. You read, your, you read your first work of the canon, your first work of classics, and you were hooked almost instantly. That was me. And next thing you know, the teacher was like, you know what? When we had the, you know, in the end of the year, you can pick where you want to work the following year. She said, you know what? Why don't you take this class on great books and I'm going to go back to elementary school. <laughs> and I did. Matter of fact, I became so addicted to classics, I quit my grad assistantship that was paying my doctorate uh, tuition because I wanted to devote more of my time. I even changed my research topic from you know, theater arts in the classroom to the relevance of classics or great books in the African-American community. And so everyone thought I was crazy. My department thought I was nuts. Everything I had, and I began to see a change in my heart. Um, the University of Maryland did allow me to go to St. John's as a part of my doctorate program. So I could do more research on classics and great books. And I began to bring those things. Journal all the time. I began to keep a running journal of my experiences of teaching classics to my students each year. Um, and my heart began to soften. My views on race relationships began to shift. And everyone at the University of Maryland, as I came to the end of my doctoral work, thought I was on a Cooper or Frederick Douglass and the Negro spirituals and all of the people that look like me who began to feel what I felt. Their minds were awakened to the power of the canon. And even though people were like, this, this crazy black woman in our department that just thinks the canon is the answer to everything. And even though I was a little bit isolated in that journey, 
I couldn't let go of the truth that God had revealed to me. So why are the classics this powerful? What makes them more than just something to read? Well, the study of mythology, epics, the histories, rhetorical strategies. There's a book I called, I think it's called A Well-Trained Mind by, oh, I gotta remember her name, but um, Weisbauer, Susan Weisbauer, I think is her name. Um, she says, the great books, the canon, our rhetoric and action. And I'm gonna come back to that thought. Remember that I said, remember that I've said rhetoric and action, and I'm gonna come back to that thought in a minute. Um, and the philosophical meditations on the virtuous life. So when, our, when my ancestors read them, they were immediately, just like I was, transferred to this world that opened up their understanding of humanity. That enlightenment was so liberating that it hooked them in. Classics are also a body of knowledge historically recognized as a sign of the highest academic achievement. But I don't wanna stop there because a lot of times when we stop at, oh, this is the highest form of academic achievement. That, especially here in our country. Um, the reason for this is because of how it is a tangible record of the story of humanity. Yes, there have been lots of people of color, diverse people who have stories they have told that tell the story of humani humanity. But the work of the canon is this, you know, sometimes they've gotten lost as one nation overcomes another. Libraries have been lost. Collections of written works have been lost and you have to really try to piece the fragments together. But the canon has been brought together over the centuries, right? And you can read them and actually see all of our story. Not only do the stories relate to all of our human themes as Mortimer Adler beautifully um, points out in his work, years of work of showing the common human themes in the works of the canon, but they actually show our heritage. You can read different times uh, about somebody from the West, but you'll see how they intersect from somebody with Africa, they may intersect with somebody from Asia. Like if you read, like if you think about the Bible and how many different diverse populations are mentioned there, or if you read Herodotus and, and many of the, I mean, I even read something about uh, the Egyptians views on geometry and Euclid's elements. Like you can see the diversity of humanity and how those intersected and how we were all kind of dwelling together. Not perfect by the way, but definitely not separated by the color line like we are here. And so this is what makes them the highest form of academic achievement because we have this tangible collection that begins with the beginning of man. It's not like it started in the 1800s. Like we have the text, <laughs> I consider the Bible a classic, right? Um, we have the text that literally talks about how man was created. So the canon includes all of the works that start at the beginning of humanity all the way on. And if you read it through, what an amazing story you get. And as I began to research the story of my people understanding this and the enlightenment that people like James Baldwin received by reading this tangible evidence of our story and our common humanity, I wanted more of that. And I wanted more of that for everyone, but especially the African-American people. In early education, especially in America, classics were studied along with theology and often was foundational to its teaching. I want to make sure I'm keeping track of my time here. So that's another piece. There are a lot of times where people will say, oh, you know, the classics or the canon is, that's for the West or that's for the white man or that's not for me. And I have a very difficult response to that. And I say it to any and everyone, I don't care what color your skin is. I may not like how my ancestors got here and I may not like what we experienced being here, but there's absolutely nothing we can do to change the fact that this country was started by a certain group of people. And just like I would go to France Right. If I wanted to go live in France and the logic of it makes pretty good sense. Right. If you want to go live in France. And you say, well, 
this is France and nothing, you know, in France looks like where I'm from. So, you know, I refuse to learn anything about this place. What do you do? If you go to France, you're going to learn the language. You're going to learn the culture, the literature, the politics, everything that makes the country run and function. Why is it so different here? And so if America was founded on this study of classics, shouldn't we all be engaged with it? My ancestors felt that and they believed that and they weren't assimilating. They weren't looking down on their heritage. I'm gonna share a quote with you by James Baldwin and he also addresses this same comment. They recognize that this is foundational to where we live. Every single one of our founding fathers had a classical education. How can you understand how to dwell here, how to make a difference here if you don't know the language? This is something Martin Luther King understood, which is why we have the Civil Rights Act of 1964, because he knew the language, he was literate. And then finally classics, their philosophical, intellectual, literary, literary and moral understandings did not presume black inferiority. So when someone comes to me and says, you know, those books make us out to be inferior. I'll always ask a simple question. Have you read them? And it's usually crickets that I hear on that question. Until you have read them and experienced them like my ancestors have, how your ancestors have, it's hard to make a judgment, but we see the power of their work. This is a picture of William Scarborough. This is my first example of a black man who was transformed by the power of classics. He was born a slave here in America and he went on to be the first black classical scholar in America. He became the president of Wilberforce University and he also wrote one of the most comprehensive textbooks on, on Latin that are still used today from a slave. Classics could provide a strong foundation for black cultural and intellectual progress. Classics could be the source of intellectual and cultural responses to racist evaluations of black humanity and intellectual capacity. Classics were a tool for blacks to build civic and spiritual virtue, to encourage heroism, value, pursue civic equality and cultivate artistic and intellectual life. There are stories of these literature groups that Blacks would form around classics, like a, like, a, like a Socratic seminar. They would just sit around and discuss classic texts. And so that's a whole nother area of research. Classics are integrated, powerful and enduring transmitters of cultural values. They transcend time, cultures, ethnicities, and we can all relate. But there was a challenge, you know, Black history has caused Black Americans in our current time to question what is virtuous and val valuable. So as I'm sharing with you, I don't want you to be confused and think I'm forgetting what we went through as a people. And I share this picture, the most graphic one I could find of what we went through as a people coming here as in, to be enslaved. And so these values are hard to see in American history, religion, politics, and cultural life. And some may say, well, that happened in the past. You've got to learn to forgive. It is very hard. I'm here we are in 2021. I'm 47. I'm not ashamed to say it. I'm thankful for life, especially in these times. And my great grandmother was a slave. She was sold away from her brother and sister as a little girl. And even though she died at about 90 years old, she died crying to see them. So when you grow up in a heritage with those stories, it's, it's really, you cannot just forget. And so these things block us from understanding where, um, it, I call it PTSD, you know? You kind of look at things just on the surface and you make a judgment call on it and it just causes you to resist things or to become very defensive. And so because of that, we resist the value of the classics. My hope is that this talk will help to peel some of those layers back. These values are often seen through the lens of white racism and American Christianity. Blacks were deprived of the true value in classical study as a result of slavery, oppression, and racism. And so many early Blacks, when they studied classics, they didn't really have the opportunity to study them just for their virtue. 
for their value, for their inspiration. They were reading them to survive. So when, when, when black people were enslaved, they weren't, as I read um, Frederick Douglass's book, one of the things that caused, and he talks about it later in this chapter, one of the things that caused the master's wife to turn is the master had told her she was not allowed to teach him to read anymore. And every time she he got caught reading, that created problems for her in her own home. It was against the law to teach black people to read and write. In fact, if a black person was caught with a pencil in hand or a book in their hand, they would be lynched, their hands would be cut off. And so language and literacy and cultural understanding was not made accessible to us. So you have many of the enslaved people were really good at, on the one hand, looking subservient, looking like they're just gonna be a slave, but paying attention to, hmm, what is the master reading over there? Huh, what's that textbook the master's children are using? And when the master wasn't looking, they were like, give me some of that. Let me read that book. Because whatever's in that book is helping you survive here. Maybe it can help me too. And so in this attitude of I've got to survive, what can I use to survive? There was not the freedom to just ah, relax and sit back and enjoy the story of Odysseus. It was more so, what can I learn from Odysseus on how to get out of here, you know? And so everything got lost in that struggle. And so now I feel like there needs to be this revival of, let's go back to these classics that liberated my people and read them. If it was powerful enough to liberate, now let's read it to inspire. So the, I, I'm building that case. I'm building that case for who were these people reading the classics? I've shared with you the story of Frederick Douglass's master's wife and her early efforts to teach him to read and that was cut short. I've shared with you how even the founding fathers were all educated classically. I'm going back and forth between these two spaces so you can see that these texts are smack dab in the middle of all of us. They are our common ground. So Frederick Douglass's wife, the slave mistress started teaching him to read when he was about six, but the master made her stop. And he says, if you teach, oh, I'm not even gonna read that word. I don't like to say it, but there you see it on the screen. If you teach him how to read, there would be no keeping him it would forever make him unfit to be a slave. It would make him discontented. So that's the first thing that began to happen with classics. And it's kind of similar to what maybe have happened to all of us, right? If the first time, or maybe you remember the first time you read the classic that made you want to read more classics, right? Maybe you started out, maybe you were homeschooled and your mom made you do classical education. You thought all of it was so boring until one day you met Plato. Or maybe one day you saw, you read Odysseus about Odysseus and you were just inspired. For me, it was Aristotle's parts of animals. I don't know why, but that's what happened. That was my enlightenment moment. And so for Douglas, he was one of those slaves who was pretending to be like, I'm just gonna be a slave. I'm just, you know, I'm a nobody. I'm just gonna focus on serving my master. But the whole time he had one eye on, what are the master's children reading at school? And he discovered the Columbian Orator, which is a collection, an anthology of excerpts of classic texts. And he began to, he had lots of little skills he could do. He would earn little money as a slave. He was 12 or 13 and he would earn money on the side. And he went to a bookseller. You can look this up on YouTube. There's a wonderful documentary on it on one, a news channel. And he goes to this bookseller. Now it's illegal for a slave to own a book. But he sneaks into this bookshop and buys the Colombian orator. And this white man who owns it looks around and says, okay, I'm gonna sell this book to you, but you better not tell anybody where you got it. Douglas kept his word. In fact, he doesn't even mention where he got the book in his autobiography. And it says that he read from this text and the writings of Cicero and others gave him, he said, the words to use, the rhetoric. Remember I said these texts are rhetoric in action. He said, I read these texts and I was given the rhetoric, the logic for my speeches. And he's working on this as an enslaved person. The master's words to Douglas were harsh, but true. 
From the moment he was exposed to literacy, even though the mistress was, was made to stop, Douglas was compelled to learn to read. And he says, these words sank deep into my heart, stirred up sentiments within that lay slumbering. It was a new and special revelation explaining dark and mysterious things. So I set out with high hope and a fixed purpose at whatever cost of trouble to learn to read. There was an enlightening moment. Paulo Freire, um, I know he's a little bit controversial, but there's a statement he makes from his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. I've been really looking into what were black people going through because just about all of them read classics. Why did they read them? And why were they so addicted to them? Like they were obsessed with them. You'll see it as I talk more. And what was it about these things I can identify? And, and Paulo Freire says, the awakening of critical consciousness leads the way to the expression of social discontents, just like the master said, right? Precisely because these discontents are real components of an oppressive situation. So, so a lot of times, what the master was saying is, if you teach him to read, he's gonna—he's not gonna want to be a slave anymore. That's basically what the master was saying. So don't teach him to read because he'll realize he's human. He'll begin to see himself as equal to you. He'll want to be free. He won't want to do his work. He'll become awakened. That is what classics do. They awaken us. They reveal our shared humanity as we look at the common themes. I know when I was teaching classics to my students, my first set of students were six African-American male high school students, all about six feet. I'm only five feet. And to hear them read Socrates and laugh at how he trips people up with their questions, and then to hear them say, he's just like us. These are things that we do. There was an awakening of these books are not just for a certain group of people. These are for all of us. They affirm our equal humanity. And so the works of the canon and classics have been tools for liberating the minds of oppressed people. And you will see it over and over and over. And you actually see it in stories of people not of African descent. You see this process of kind of being Du Bois, we're gonna talk about this a little bit later too, in a veil, this kind of cloud. And then you get a hand on this text from the ancients and from those who love the ancients and something awakens. Look at that cute face. Look at Frederick Douglass. As a child, the light came on in Douglass's mind and he was liberated in his mind before he was able to free his body. I love this book, Anamkara by John O'Donohue, but there's a special quote in it that says, we are always on a journey from darkness to light. At first, we are children of darkness. Your body and your face were formed first in the kind darkness of your mother's womb. Your birth was first a journey from darkness to light. The miracle of thought is its presence in the night side of your soul. The brilliance of thought is born in darkness. Light is the mother of life. Once human beings began to search for a meaning to life, light became one of the most powerful metaphors to express depth of life. Frederick Douglass, when he got his hands on that Colombian orator, it says he felt dead. He felt, I will never be free. And then he would sneak off into his little slave cabin and read. He would read the, 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 the dialogue between a master and slave. And he read about how this slave was able to convince his master to go free. And he was like, I can do that. I can convince slave masters to, to, to set their slaves free. And there was hope born. He began to see that I'm not a slave. I'm not meant to be just some mere uh, farm animal. I am a human being, I am a man. Sojourner Truth would say, ain't I a woman? <laughs> and so connecting to these texts awakened this light that shined within him that said, I am a human being, I am equal to those who think they can oppress me and I deserve freedom. This lot of bearing the burden of slavery is not mine. And one thing I'll also notice when I'm reading classic texts or the canon with those who don't look like me, there's an enlightenment we all have come to. 
And it allows us to be able to engage in civil discourse, whether our political parties are different, our religions are different, our belief systems are different, our backgrounds are different, our socioeconomic status is different. Even if there's all these differences, these canons, these works of the canon draw us in and we can engage in civil discourse because you can look at me and I can look at you and no matter what our history may say, we recognize our common humanity. So I like to give examples, one or two, after I speak about the main person connected to these main points of my talk. And I like to use him, the co-founder of the Black Panther, as an extreme example for all of those who want to consistently say, those books are not for us. They teach us to you know, be subservient. They are support white supremacy. Well, the co-founder of the Black Panther, although there are many things about them that I would not necessarily practice myself. I'm very much a fan of Martin Luther King. I appreciate their desire to free the African-American people from the oppression of Jim Crow, from the threat of lynchings. The Black Panthers were born out of an effort to protect Black communities from being lynched and from violence because that was so pervasive at the time and there was no no one you could go to, the police would not help, would not provide justice, would not protect. So the Black Panthers all carried guns, most of them legally, and they would protect their communities so that their people could not be lynched anymore. And were they human and make mistakes? Did they sometimes do things that weren't right? Some of them did, but that's not what the Black Panther Party was. That was individuals. And the co-founder of the Black Panther taught himself to read. From the time he was young till he was 18, he was completely illiterate. And he was in the streets. He wasn't even thinking about doing anything about helping Black people. And he was in jail. And then around that time he was coming out of jail, he decided that he was tired of living this way and he was going to teach himself to read at 18. And his brother was already in school and he got his hand on his brother's book, Plato's Republic. And he read it 10 times. The first time using dictionaries, asking people to, to help him sound out words. He read it once just to work through the work. Then he read it the second time. He said, I think about the third or fourth or fifth time, he began to understand it. And then he got to the allegory of the cave. And he said, from reading that, he decided, I'm going to free all black people. So. If this person can read a classic and decide I'm gonna free black people and to create a whole organization to support black people, how do we draw the conclusion that these texts are irrelevant to people of color? An extreme example, I show an extreme example to reveal the power of these texts. All right, so, the canon is a tool of liberating. I hope I've given you a clear example. I'm trying to watch my time. Let's look at the canon as a tool for healing. W.E.B. Du Bois calls the darkness we're under, this, this illiteracy, this not having the cultural understanding of the world that we live in. One of the things that makes Martin Luther King so beautiful, he was very much about liberating black people, but his study of the classics, and he says his philosophy is rooted in classics and the works of the canon, gave him an understanding of the constitution and all of the legal documents he needed to research and study so he could advocate for our freedoms. All of that is rooted in classics. All of the work of Martha King is rooted in his study of the canon. W.E.B. Du Bois calls this darkness, though, this resistance to these works that are foundational to our society, a veil. It's not just the evil of slavery or the physical bondage or the physical brutality or the being ripped from families or, or oppression after slavery, but the mental darkness African Americans, Black people suffered from, taken from their native land, tongue, culture, and literacy, and place where they could not understand anything, right? Like we all, we can go travel. Like if I decided um, I'm going to uh, Poland at some point before this year is over and I'm nervous because I've never been, uh, I've been to the Caribbean, but 
never to a European country and I'm, oh my goodness, you know, how am I gonna learn this language? You know, like what if I run into somebody who doesn't speak English? I don't know, maybe I will, maybe I won't. But you know what? I'm gonna have the freedom to say, excuse me, could you accept, could, could you help me read this sign? Could you do this for me so you can help me navigate my way through this foreign land? Well, black people were brought here to America and were forbidden to know how to read and write. All the slave masters thought they needed to know was how to slave, <laughs> how to be a slave, how to serve and do the work. And so unless that is addressed, they continue to be in this veil. Du Bois speaks of the healing nature of classics and the works of the canon here. And he says, I sit with Shakespeare and he winces not. Across the color line, I move arm in arm with Balzac and Dumas, where smiling men and welcoming women glide in gilded halls. I summon Aristotle and Aurelius and what soul I will, and they come all graciously with no scorn nor condescension. So wed with truth, I dwell above the veil. Is this the life you begrudge us, O knightly America? Are you so afraid, lest peering from this high pisca of equality, I, insert, I put that in there, between Philistine and Amalekite, we sight the promised land, right? We go back, remember I've asked you, do you remember that time when you first read a classic? I remember. Or do you remember that time where maybe you thought classics was boring until you found, got your hands on a classic that spoke to your soul and your mind was awakened and before long you wanted to read all classics? He's talking about that moment is the lifting of the veil. And what is what are we becoming enlightened about? The world in which we live, who these people are that don't look like me, that you become empathetic to who what their life experiences are. Now, have some people used the study of the canon, the study of classics as a way to create a line of elitism? Absolutely, I'm not ignoring that. But I don't focus on those because Everybody, you know, we're human beings. People always, my mom says, you know, God is a great, great provider, but mankind and the devil are perverters. We can mess up anything. My mind is not on how people misuse classics because there's too much evidence of how people use them right. That's where my focus is. And I use that to inspire all of us to come to this table to read them. W.B. Du Bois gave a clear explanation on classical education and its importance in the education of Black Americans. He was able to show the difference between the racist form of classical education and the classical study of Western civilization. He fought against Booker T. Washington's views on trying to just settle for manual labor and just trying to get along here without going for as high as you can intellectually. intellectually. And he thought classical education should be used to fight for Black civil rights and higher education. He felt the pursuit of Black people should be um, higher education through classical studies and civil rights. And he sought to educate blacks on the hidden beauties of life through classical study, but that knowledge should be used to fight for civil rights and equality, not to look down on others, even though sometimes he did that, not a perfect man. But I hold on to what his intention was, that our gaining of classical study or reading the canon is how do we make humanity better and how do we bring humanity together? And another soul healed through classical study was Phyllis Wheatley, the first black woman published in America. And she was purchased as a slave from Senegal by John Wheatley, but they tutored her in classical education. She became proficient in Latin and she learned all the classic texts and she wrote beautiful poetry, all inspired by classics. Her poems were so amazing. She wrote George Washington. So she's around right at the beginnings of America. So you see this Phyllis Wheatley and there's others like her give you an example of, I mean, if, if Phyllis Wheatley knew George Washington, that means basically as soon as black people got here to America, before it was even a country, they were studying classics. Let that sink into your spirit for a minute. As soon as black people got here from Africa, it didn't take them but a minute to look around and say, I need to read these texts. Why? Because I need to try to figure out who these people are that have captured me and how I can build that bridge. And so she wrote a poem to George Washington. And if I had time, I'd read it to you, but I see my time is getting short, but he, read, he wrote her back. I'm gonna read one line, I'm gonna read one line. I can't read this, he said. Um, I am, this is how he ends his letter to Phyllis Wheatley. I am with great respect, 
your obedient, humble servant. Hello, George Washington saying that to an enslaved woman, Phyllis Wheatley, she wrote that to him. And that's how he responds to her. Did George Washington own slaves? Absolutely. Does that frustrate me? Absolutely. But yet this story shows this bridge, right? That this black enslaved woman was able to make to this white man. And, you know, and so I think about the allegory of the cave and go back a little bit. Um, she left her cave. She, and, and you can see traces in her poetry that she missed her homeland. Many people think she was um, rejecting her heritage, but she wasn't. That's a whole nother presentation. She was doing what we call a Trojan horse with her poetry. She would like in subliminal messages and through metaphors, she talked about her frustration of being taken from her homeland and missing her homeland and being proud of her African heritage. But she recognized her only choice would be to leave her cave of not being bitter about her situation, but how can I make a bridge to them? So that was her leaving her cave. She left her experiences and said, I can make a bridge to these people. We are all in the darkness of our caves. And so we resist unity. We resist knowing what's true about our shared humanity and the division continues. When Frederick Douglass began to read these texts, the light of truth lifted him from the veil, the darkness. What if all of humanity did the same? What if you and I did the same, left our caves, came together around these common texts that we can all share and connect to? Could it bring us all together in a more perfect union through the light of truth? The canon as a tool for building unity. Last part, this line right here from, I always say, my husband said, I'm allowed to have a boyfriend as long as they're dead. So Frederick Douglass and James Baldwin and W. E. Du Bois are my boyfriends. That's, that means like, oh my gosh, I love these people. And so James Baldwin, I love him so much, probably more than most because of how he, if, especially if you read the book, The Fire Next Time, he really talks about his struggle with being a black man in America. He doesn't hide from that. He doesn't try to dilute that. He doesn't Uncle Tom his way through that. Um, I don't like that term, but just so you know what I'm talking about. Um, he doesn't do that. He addresses his struggle. But then he says, at the end of the day though, the only choice we have is to do, is to love and to build a bridge to do like Phyllis Wheatley did, to, to, to try to reach out and see how we can come together. And so he says this statement, he said, I brought to Shakespeare, Bach, Rembrandt, to the Stones of Paris, to the Cathedral of Chartres, and to the Empire State Building. He goes all over the world and all through classics and all of that, all through great, I mean, not classics, but all through the canon. Um, a special attitude. These were not really my creations. They did not contain my history. He's honest about that. I might search in them in vain forever for any reflection of myself. I was an interloper. This was not my heritage. At the same time, I had no other heritage which I could possibly hope to use. I had certainly been unfitted for the jungle or the tribe. Meaning he's saying, I, I would love to be in Africa, but that's, I mean, my, my ancestors have been here for hundreds of years. Like this is all I got. America's the only home I have. And I'm like, Baldwin, I'm with you. I would have to appropriate these white centuries. I would have to make them mine. I would have to accept my special attitude, my special place in this scheme. Otherwise I would have no place in any scheme. In classics, how classics unifies. In classics, we study Greek mythology and yet we learn about the first cause that Aristotle believed in. And this helps all religions to feel welcome. Just give you some examples of how we can come together. In classics, we study Western civilization. And yet in these texts, we learn how these authors were influenced by people from other lands like Africa. Those of you who, if you look like me, if you're listening to me and you're resisting classics, you're missing out on an entire history on ancient African civilizations that is so clearly written and so beautifully written. And to hear people from the West talk about the beauty of the people of Africa and the power of the people of Africa, you're missing out on that. Even if you're just studying African texts, if you read that, it would fill in a lot of holes of our place in the story of humanity. In classics, we study what the founding fathers studied, but also what MLK, Du Bois, Douglas, Anna Julia Cooper, I wish I could have talked about all these people. James Baldwin, Toni Morrison, who minored in classic. Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, 
the enslaved, the freed, every American ancestor, black or white, has studied these. It is our common ground. Classics reveal our unified humanness because they cover the topics relevant to every human being and all of humanity has intersected at the classics. How blacks use classics to integrate into American society. Integration and assimilation are two different things. Integration is me taking my beautiful chocolate skin self and saying, this is my home. I'm not going to hide from who I am. I'm not going to hide it from you, but I still want to come into this place and figure out how this culture is and get the literacy I need, literacy I need to thrive in this foreign land. Assimilation is I'm trying to look like you, be like you, forget who I am. So use, these were used to craft more correct political, ethical, religious, and intellectual positions, embracing the values of the classics to rewrite the narrative of their lives. Frederick Douglass was beautiful and others like him. Ola Uda Equiano was another example. They used their mastery of the English language gained by studying classics to write their own autobiography so that no one else can tell someone else about what their life was, but they get to tell their own story in a language that everyone can read and appreciate. Focuses on wisdom and good judgment, focuses on courage, greatness of soul, gentleness, honesty, Sadly, racism, and we feel it today, distracted from the intellectual and moral values classics tried to present. But my ancestors were able to have the strength to look past that, and they read the texts for themselves. Who's another one who's used the classics to unify? I don't feel right calling him my boyfriend, although it's tempting. I, for some reason, about I just can't do it. So this is a man I greatly admire. His letter from a Birmingham jail is filled with numerous references to the works of the canon. And in his autobiography, autobiography, he talks about how classics helped him to shape his philosophy for the civil rights movement. And here's a quote that he says, just as Socrates, see he was inspired by Socrates who was always being a gadfly someplace. That's what got him killed. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and air truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, so we must see the need for non-violent gadflies. He chose to fight with logic to create the kind of tension in society that will help man rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. And to see Martin Luther King stand there next to Lyndon B. Johnson signing that civil rights bill of 1964, it's because of Martin Luther King that my children can go to an amusement park. It's because of him that I can ride on any bus I want to and sit anywhere I want to. It's because of him that my kids can go to any school they want to. Ah, I'm getting emotional. This man who taught a class in classics at Morehouse College, reading the works of the canon, is the one who wrote, I have a dream. And this man brought us together. He's dead. But he has accomplished more than anybody ever has because all of the freedoms and all of the unity that we all enjoy, me being here with you right now, is because of this man who studied pervasively the classics. And his work and his death brought us together, rooted in classics. And Anna Julia Cooper, I end with her. Her work did the same, but through education her belief just quickly in educating African-American children through teaching them Latin and teaching them classic texts gave birth to so many men and women who went out to start their own schools. They went to some of the top colleges in the nation. The former child of her slave master came out of slavery. One of the first women to get a PhD from the Sorbonne studied the classics and used it as a way to heal the hurts of her people, to elevate her people and to help us integrate into this place that once saw us as less than human. 
I want to share this with you. I'm going to end on two poems, one by Maya Angelou and one by me. And my hope is that everything I've shared with you inspires you to free yourself, to free yourself, to look at your person, of your, your friends, who may be people of color, to learn about their human narrative. My hope is that if you look like me and you have chocolate skin, that you feel the desire to leave your cave. And don't just stamp that person as an ancestor of the oppressor, but we are all human beings. Oh, wait a minute, let me pause it because I got to share the sound. Hold on one second. I'm going to share again. And I always forget to do that. It's a running joke at my school. Miss Anika, why do you always forget to turn on the sound? <laughs> and here we go. I note the obvious differences in the human family. Some of us are serious. Some thrive on comedy. I've sailed upon the seven seas and stopped in every land. I've seen the wonders of the world, not yet one common man. I know 10,000 women called Jane and Mary Jane. I've not seen any two who really were the same. Mirror twins are different, although their features jibe, and lovers think quite different thoughts while lying side by side. I note the obvious differences between each sort and type, but we are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. And let me go back. I'm going to stop share one more time. And I want to share a poem I've written recently that um, is called Human Tapestry. And I just feel like it really expresses so much that poem by Maya Angelou. We are one sewn together by centuries of dwelling on this planet together, our lives intertwined to make a beautiful image of unity, different shades, different hair, different lips, but the same blood, the same minds, the same world, the same heart, together creating a story of humanity that is not all one color, but one rainbow, reflecting the beauty of humanity in one tapestry. I'm a Christian and I follow everything God's word tells me to live by. And it's my desire to live as Christ lived, on the one hand, telling the truth of his purpose to bring salvation to everybody. But if you look at the stories of Jesus and as he walked this earth, bringing people together, he loved people, even those who did not agree with him. It says he grew in favor with God and with man. And that is my desire is to see us on the one hand, yes, being a light in this world, sharing the light of Christ with everyone. But even if people don't agree with us or live as the way we think they should live at the end of the day, we treat everybody with respect and love as equal human beings. And I believe the canon is a great tool to make that happen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. I can't hear you. Can you hear me at all? No? No? I can hear you barely. Hello? Can you hear me now? Are you getting better? (laughs) Am I doing, did I do something? No. Your volume? I can only hear like a whisper.
going to sign off. And okay. Sign okay. Yeah. Now you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Yeah. I'm going to bring up, uh, I'm going to manage people in the chat here, but if anybody would like to ask a question, please uh, come up here or shout. I think you can, can you kind of hear us? Yes. yes. If you talk loud, if you talk a little bit loud, I can hear you really well. Okay, so let's take some questions. heritage that he was reading in a sense, but was able to find, uh, bring in his own perspective. Yes. And as a student who's never had an opportunity to be in the classroom studying the classics with another black student and has been around white students for my entire college experience, I'm wondering if there is an understanding or an approach to something like the, uh, the Republic that um, someone with your perspective would come to a different understanding of or have a different viewpoint that I don't have the opportunity to know. And I was wondering how um, we could, as students, gather that different understanding or come to have a deeper understanding of the Republic as Plato wrote it um, without having access to some of those Black voices that have different experiences. Yeah. And what you'd recommend to a student to come to a deeper understanding through um, having, without having that ability to connect with a Black student who might have some added information or an added truth that would help. Yes. That's a, oh, that's a phenomenal question. Um, I would say if, if, like, okay, first of all, let me say this to Plato, you're about the cave. I would read um, Huey P. Newton's autobiography. I think it's called Revolutionary Suicide. Huey P. Newton, because he talks about it. He talks about how that text what what perspective he came to with that text and why it led him to want to free all black people. And so that's one example. And so uh, most, if not, I always say most because I always feel like all, you know, can kind of, you might find one who hasn't, but I haven't found one yet. But so I'll say most African-Americans, especially the early, what I call freedom, freedom fighters, those who fought for the abolition of slavery, those who fought civil rights, um, even Angela Davis read classics and the works of the canon. All of them, their writings, you will see traces of the canon in their writing. So if you go back and begin to really delve deep into, I'm looking for a text that might help you get started. Um, it is the Norton Anthology of African American Literature, and it is edited and put together by um, Henry Louis Gates. I think he's out of Harvard. Um, if you get that text, it has excerpts, and he does it in a timeline starting from the slave near uh, spirituals and slave narratives all the way up to contemporary literature. And in it, he, at the bottom of the pages, he has footnotes of the different um, references to classic texts that are in the book. And that's just a great way to see how Black people are using classics to help them develop their own narratives. So uh, to answer your question, finding, uh, and, and I, I give that example of the anthology because it's, you know, and then you can read the rest of the book because it's just excerpts of different ones. It's a two volume set. But then those that will lead you to the actual books and you can read the whole book and then get that connection. Uh, but James Baldwin talks a lot about classics and how what connections he's making to him. Matter of fact, to my knowledge, his he and his father dies. He is he was angry at his father because his father would not let him read the canon. 
and he talks about that in is it autobiographical sketches, which is a part of his. Uh, Lord, I, I'm getting all the titles, but it's called autobiographical sketches. You can find it online. And he talks about his dad not letting him read the works of the canon and how his father just believed black people were too inferior to understand the canon. And he was very bitter at his dad for doing that to him. And so he writes a lot about his connections to the works of the canon and how they inform his work. So I think that would be a good place to start is reading these early black thinkers, writers, uh, activists, and that'll give you some, some access. Okay, thank you. I have your email, so I'll probably be writing you. Yes, please, yes, feel free. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's see if there's another chat. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, I, I noticed uh, when you were talking, you would refer to classics and to the canon. Sometimes classics means different things to different people. Mm -hmm. um, but I noticed that a lot of your sources you were mentioning were all pre-modern. So when you talk about the canon, what really could lead to healing and reconciliation, is there something unique about those pre-modern early voices uh, or are there modern voices as well that might be helpful? I love these questions. Like this is one of my favorite questions. Okay, so let me first explain what my definition is of classics and the canon. Okay, so the classics, um, and if you wanna see this again, I have a video on this. It's like a little short, like five minute video describing the difference between the two. And it's on my YouTube channel. Um, just look for Dr. Anika Prather. But um, what happens is, okay, so the classics are the study of the ancient texts of Greece and Rome and, and anything that intersects there. That's classics. Um, that's the official definition. All right, the canon, includes or the or the canon of western civilization or great books of western civilization that's that's interchangeable includes classics but i love mortimer adler's definition it's i love his whole formula but his belief is that there's this great conversation and so to be in the canon you are citing anyone who cites anyone from classics so like there's this constant so you get a sense that Socrates is talking to Augustine and Augustine is talking to Henry David Thoreau or what have you. And so, um, and that's the rule. And that's actually a rule I still stick with. And so even if I'm reading an African-American text, I read a lot, but for my research and my study and my whole philosophy of education, I'll read uh, black text that connects to um, classics, which lets you, and, and I've just read um, um, Between the World and Me and I consider it following the rules. I'm just saying, because he talks about Prometheus in the first chapter, but I digress. And so, um, but that's my rule. Anyone who uses classics, whether, no matter who they are, I want to pull them into the great conversation. All right, and so the canon includes classics, ancient Greece and Rome, but it also includes Augustine um, and others. Now, the second part of your question is, why did I spend so much time, I guess, in the pre-modern or that ancient time, there's a book you all must read called, ah, here it is, I got it right here. It's called Before Color Prejudice, written by Frank Snowden. I love the classics the most, but I read all of the canon because it's before the color prejudice times. And so what you're reading from Socrates and Aristotle and you know the Greek myths and the plays and all of that, really purely is dealing with the story of humanity without any tainting of colonization or enslavement or the middle passage. It just doesn't trickle in there. And it feels like this really safe, neutral space. Um, and, and, and you can see it in the ancient historians, their views on people from Africa were so different, just so pure, so they respected people of color. It wasn't a perfect place, I'm not saying that. They had their own vices and they even had some prejudices. It was just very different from the world we know. And so I talk a lot about that because it's, it's a little bit more inviting, even though I do read all of the classics at some point. I mean, all of, all of the canon at some point. We got some... If, if uh, those on the chat want to join in, we have somebody here live, but please feel free. Hello, thank you for your talk. It was fantastic. Oh, um, My question involves, you brought up mythology earlier. I was just wondering, what, what do the mythological works of Homer and Virgil and others in the Western tradition have to do with uh, 
or how does their work impact and reveal stuff in racial healing or through the uh, African-American intellectuals you had on display today? Yeah. A lot of the black authors look at the heroism. That's a big thing. I know like, for example, Phyllis Wheatley talked a lot about, oh uh, gosh, uh, what was his name? My brain is forgetting. Oh, there was no Odysseus. Achilles, thank you. Okay, <laughs> my brain was. So she looks a lot at Achilles, and she looks a lot at the um, the Greek wars and the battles, and looks at the heroes, and she, and then she does this thing where she connects it to David and Goliath. So she's really into heroism, which is an example of when I remember when I said earlier that a lot of people think that Phyllis Wheatley was trying to deny her heritage, but she was really doing uh, resistance through metaphor. So when you see her talking about you know, she's gonna rise up like Achilles or, you know, she's gonna tear down this Goliath or what have you, you know, a white person of that time would read that and say, oh, she's so gifted with, you know, reading classics or she loves God, she's reading the Bible. And the whole time she was like, I can't stand being a slave and I can't wait to conquer you, you know? Um, and so that is one way <laughs> that black people connected with the myths is they found inspiration and magic to overcome such an oppressive situation. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yes. I had a question in regards to the great conversation that you were mentioning. So obviously the Western uh, tradition has a great conversation with different perspectives. You mentioned the uh, different perspectives of Du Bois and uh, Booker T. Washington. And we also have very different perspectives on, say, a uh, hero in the eyes of Homer versus the eyes of Thomas Hobbes, or what a great man is in the eyes of Plato or Machiavelli or Nietzsche. And I was wondering if you saw any of those as being uh, better or worse in regards to promoting the liberation and healing uh, in the Western tradition. I don't. I, I, I really um, see the works of the canon. And when I, let me just say works of the canon to encompass classics. I only, I reason in my speaking, the reason why I make those distinctions is so that no one is confused. And, and the classics community, it, like if you keep calling Shakespeare a classic, it'll make somebody want to jump off a bridge. So I try to be really <laughs> careful uh, in the academic world. Like they're like, no, it's ancient Greece and Rome, like get it straight. But, um, but just between you and me, let me talk about the canon. I see the canon's works very equal, even though a lot of the authors are really messed up. Let me give a good example. So we read Marx, right? We read Marx, but I am not a Marxist. But what are we doing when we're reading these people with these different philosophies, philosophies we don't even agree with? You know, like I'm in love with Aristotle and he was not a Christian at all. Like his first cause was not um, God to me. But when I read it, I think of God, right? We read the text, not thinking which one is better, but we read the text recognizing this is someone's human narrative. This is someone's human perspective on something. And I hope I'm answering your question. So what it teaches us, as Susan Weisbauer says, reading the canon is rhetoric and action. You can't have rhetoric or you can't have a debate or dialogue if you don't have opposing thoughts. And you can't learn from other people if someone doesn't disagree with you. And so I look at reading all the works of the canon as important. And, and another thing I wanna say is this, there's a rule at St. John's when you're reading uh, when you come to seminar is that you can only talk about the text. Like if I go in and, and a dialogue and start talking about, yeah, my mother read that book back in 1953 and then she was driving down the street, like, and you're just talking about random stuff over here. Like you're not allowed to really do that. You can only talk about the words on the page and what they mean to you at that point with occasional outside connections, but really staying focused on the text. That rule, even though it seems restrictive is very liberating because it forces all of us to come to this common ground, to set aside our own hangups and to just deal with the text. And then you, what's your name? William. William, okay. And then you, William, and me and Nika can have this conversation, two very different people from very different experiences, different generations, and we can have this meaningful discussion. And a lot of times what that does, a lot of times people think when I talk about coming together around the classics, this is a really good point I wanna share with you. A lot of times 
you may be discussing great books and the canon, but it may not be talking about racial healing, but what it is doing is it's tearing down walls so that you can talk about racial healing at some point. My first awakening to the power of that is when I first, it was my first year at St. John's. I was so nervous because I was the only black person in the seminar. And um, I had really enjoyed the discussion following those St. John's rules. And then my tutor and I stayed after class and talked about other things like walls, my fear of being the only black person in the room. Like all of my fears had been torn down by the simple process of two different people talking about something common, which is this text that's outside of these maybe negative experiences and negative histories. And then in that process, a bond begins. Have you ever been like in a seminar with someone talking about a text that has nothing to do with anything outside the text, but it made you develop a friendship with that person? Like, have yep. you ever, you know what I mean? So that, that process of doing it, um, creates, that's the second part that happens. It can be used to discuss racial healing, but it can also be used to tear down the walls so you can talk about racial healing. Hope that answered your question. Uh, if I might ask a brief follow-up, the reason I asked was specifically because of your comments regarding the boy in Booker T. Washington. And it seemed to me like you were indicating that while it's very valuable to read and discuss both of them, that you believe the vision of the boy to be the one that is greater for the, uh, shall we say, the promotion of the tradition. And I was yeah. curious about those sorts of debates when we have these great conversations that are very important to read, but yeah. cannot be both a Marxist and a Nietzschean at the same time. For okay, okay, I understand what you're saying. Okay, so I think I understand what you're saying. So are you saying, are you asking what classic texts are best for exploring that thought of classics being the best type of study for this? Or is that what you're asking? I think the question is more so of the visions of the classics that provides the vision of the teleology that is most effective for this project. Okay, oh, I got, okay, I think I know what you're saying. What, basically you're asking what texts are the best for what we're talking about today besides Booker T. Washington or Du Bois? Yes. There you go, okay. <laughs> All right, we got there. Um, definitely Du Bois. Um, Anna Julia Cooper's uh, A Voice from the South is really good. She has anything she's written on education discusses that. Um, Frederick Douglass' autobiography is good for that. I recently just bought a collection of essays by Mary McLeod Bethune. She has some essays on classics as well. And, this, and there's a one line where she says, you know, um, this, this type of study, the study of Phyllis Wheatley is the best for African-American people. Um, a, Martin Luther King's autobiography is a great text. But I wanna say this, there are not a lot of texts that deal with the relevance of classical education in the black community. And so I'm currently writing one with another professor that will be out in 2022 um, through Classical Academic Press. But right now it's very much an investigative work. A, I almost feel like Indiana Jones. I mean, it's like, I've been in abandoned old schools like the Nanny Helen Burrow school and I found her class list. That's how I was able to say, wait a minute, these first black schools were teaching classics. I mean, I literally was like climbing over, like hoping like Mickey and Minnie Mouse were not around uh, to uncover evidence that the type of education that black children, black people had from the time of, so in slavery, they were sneaking it. After slavery, all the schools set up for black people were classical up until desegregation. But there's just no books to say it, it's an investigative work. But I can, and if you email me, I can send you a more comprehensive list of some texts to read to the kind of, to find the clues on this, if that makes sense. Thank you very much and best of luck in your endeavor. All right, thank you. Right. Uh, I think we have one more from the chat. Uh, we have to get over to dinner. So we'll just end with that. Michael Seiler, uh, were there any specific texts in the classical canon which more frequently impacted the legacy of it? Well, I think you kind of, maybe answered that in the last question of enslaved, yeah. enslaved African-Americans. So, yeah. uh, 
I suppose time for one more if anybody, if there's a dying. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Red? Or, Oh, I do want to say, the young man who just stepped away, there's, oh my gosh, I can't believe I forgot this. The Ebony Column by Dr. E. Ashley Hairston is a perfect book to answer your question. It's called The Ebony Column, Reclaiming the African, no, The African Reclamation of the West or some Reclamation of the West or something. The Ebony Column, just look for that. That's a really good book. He's done some good work in this area. I'll just read for that too. Thank you so much, Dr. Prather. Just wanted to ask your thoughts on whether there's been a lot of work or any work that's been done on portrayals of and opinions on slavery in classical texts. So I'm thinking specifically of the writings of St. Paul, um, along with Aristotle's uh, treatment of yes. natural slavery, yes. uh, politics, along with Nino, um, you know, because you had mentioned that, right, of course, these pre-modern texts or ancient texts are prior to the color line, but there are still theories and positions regarding slavery. Do you, mm -hmm. do you, do you have you come across work on that? And then if you have time, do you have a particular uh, interpretation of Aristotle's own teaching on slavery? Thank you. Yes. 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 Okay. So I cannot, if you email me, I can send you a list on the books, um, but based on, because I knew this question would come up, especially when me trying to get African-American black people to read classics, I knew that question was come up. So here my th here's my thinking. Notice I didn't say slavery didn't exist during then, the color line didn't exist. So and it's, it was very different. Um, slavery of course existed during that time and we have what Aristotle's thoughts were, but it wasn't based on the color of your skin. Uh, it was in America, it really, I mean, if you were thought to be black, you could even look what, can I tell your story? I can't tell your story. I'm talking to my husband. He has a real, I can't tell you, I can't tell your family story. Okay. So my husband does, did his family. This is a perfect example of what I mean of how, how intense this slavery based on color in America is. My, my husband is um, the product of um, the slave master's son and a slave woman. Okay. Down the road. And and so he was telling me the story of one of his family members uh, was a white woman. And um, I think she was a stepchild of somebody. And when the father remarried the woman, she didn't like the stepchild. So she went around telling everybody she's really mulatto. She's white, she looks white, but she's really black. Next thing you know, they did a trial. They deemed her black, changed her birth certificate to black and sold her into slavery. Why am I sharing that as an, a, like a real living example of, of how it worked in America? If you were just thought to be black, you were less than human, seen as being nothing. And we've seen 12 years a slave. The man was, you know, lived up north and he ends up being a slave in the south. In ancient times, it was, it, slavery was horrible. There was horrible treatment. There was definitely a lot of barbarianism. I, I get that barbarianism, but it wasn't based on skin and doesn't make one better than the other. I'm not saying that either. I'm more so trying to make the case that reading the ancient texts takes us away from the racism that we know so that we can heal our relationships here that which is based on race. Race was not even a concept in the ancient times. So I'm presenting the case for let's read the classic texts to get us away from this very um, frustrating space to say the least to try a new world, such as Du Bois says, I go to this place where there's no scorn nor condescension based on the color of my skin. So that's, but if you want, I can, you know, if you email me, I can get right back to you if you want more. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, that's all the time we have. Uh, once again, thank you so much, Dr. Brother. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you all so much for having uh, me. We, we hope that we'll get you here in person too. So. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Bye bye. Bye bye. Uh, all right, so uh, Neil is already here for students. And already, alumni have us there to talk about uh, tequilas.